welcome everybody uh, to our latest in our uh, OIE self-service upgrade web uh, meetup series. Today's session is going to be focused on zero trust use cases in OIE. Uh, my name is Brent Arrington, and I'm a member of the product acceleration team here at Okta, focusing on OIE. And I'm happy today to be joined by my colleague, Dimitri Volkman, from our product marketing team, also focusing on OIE, and by special guest, Steve Kamey, uh, who's the senior principal from our public sector team. We're going to be leading today's presentation. And in addition today, we're joined by some other experts, uh, OIE experts from the product acceleration team, who are going to be monitoring the Q&A section of the uh, of the Zoom webinar. So if you have questions as we're going through the content today, please post those in the Q&A and our colleagues will answer those as we go. We do have a good bit of content to get through today. Uh, before we dive in, uh, here's the ubiquitous safe harbor statement. This presentation may contain some forward-looking statements. All right, so today uh, in our presentation, we're going to start by getting an overview of zero trust principles and how Okta can help help you address those principles. We'll then review some new concepts in Okta Identity Engine that are uh, maybe new for those, those of you who are on Classic or used to Classic. We'll do a quick review of the what to expect before and after upgrading to OIE. We'll then dive into how OIE features can help uh, help address zero trust use cases for, for your organization. And finally, uh, we'll walk through the process of upgrading uh, using the self-service upgrading tooling to upgrade your classic org to an OIE org. And now for an introduction to zero trust concepts, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Steve. Hey, Brent, I appreciate it. And uh, who's responsible for that whole Save by Zero song earlier? <laughs> you got to take credit for that one. <laughs> oh, gosh. I'm sorry about that. I apologize in advance. <laughs> hey, I thought we would do a really quick, sometimes it's worth doing a quick level set on Zero Trust. And, uh, you know, Brent, I appreciate you introducing me. And um, as, you, as you mentioned, you know, I, I focus on public sector, U.S. public sector. And it's part of my role. I'm just, I, I'm really excited about things like uh, standards and best practices, particularly what comes out of the U.S. federal government, things like the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. They put best practices information out there for everyone you know, to understand. And we're going to use some of those as we move through this presentation. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. And let's think about where things were 20 years ago where it didn't work. Right. Let's obviously we always do a contrast between what zero trust is today and what we were thinking about in terms of security before. And you can already remember the mission was to wall off everything. Right. We build a network and physical security. We held our assets in a data center. We connected branch offices through VPNs and remote users and things like that. But the general idea was let's put a big wall around things and we can trust everything else on the inside. We can trust the people on the inside. We can trust the devices on the inside. We can trust the network on the inside. And everything on the outside was bad, right? And I think we all know that after two, three decades worth of breaches, uh, this model does not work, right? So let's con contrast this with what a zero trust architecture looks like. So on the next slide, the I love this quote, that, and I hate to read a slide to you, but let me just read this so it sinks in. An enterprise, an entire enterprise private network is not considered an implicit trust zone. Assets should always act as if an attacker is present on the enterprise network, and it entails actions such as authenticating connections and encrypting all traffic. This comes directly out of the National Institute of Standards and Technology that put forth a, a, a publication called NIST 800-207, the Zero Trust Architecture. And when you think about that for a second, right, that's a sharp contrast to what we just talked about. And when we dive in through the course of this presentation, it's, you know, it will really help understand where identity modernization fits in and how we can actually accomplish this idea that we can assume that every one of our networks, every single network is already breached, right? And if we do that, it changes the entire mindset. And that's what zero trust is about, right? It's not just that buzzword. It's about rethinking the way we approach cybersecurity. So on the next slide, we're going to touch on some of these principles here, right? We have three circles that, <clears throat> that kind of jump out at you. First one is least privilege. Again, not necessarily a new concept, but is a, one of those challenging things to put in practice. Least privilege is that general idea of 
giving users the least amount of privileges that they can you know, possibly have in order to do their job effectively, right? So it's that least amount of, of access and no more, nothing beyond the access. And it's also giving people the right access at the right time in the right context, right? So it's more than just like the people and, and what they're authorized to access. So we're gonna talk about things like access granting per session, right? Access granting per resource. And we'll touch on what resource is in, you know, in just a second here. Um, another aspect like that we already talked about is this idea that there is no implicit trust. We have to focus on things like auth -N, authentication, auth -Z, authorization, right? We have to make sure that we constantly consider the integrity of our assets, for example, the posture of a given de device, for example, and then securing all the communication across those networks that we may be trusted in the past, but don't trust anymore. Right. And then finally, when we talk about things like continuous monitoring, we realize that when you make an access decision, the cyber landscape changes constantly. So you have to constantly reevaluate in real time what's going on as that device changed its security posture. Is the person acting erratically? Right. Is there something new that's happening on the network? We have to take into account all of that context and use it in real time in order to take uh, actions about you know, what, what could potentially be risky activity, right? And that's that dynamic observable state that we're talking about. Accomplishing that, uh, that real vision of zero trust takes into account all that real-time context. So on the next slide, I wanted to just mention that, you know, this is one of these best practices that's really simple and easy to follow. CISA is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. They're actually part of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And one of the, their charters is Infrastructure Security, the IS, right? They, they actually put a lot of uh, best practices out there for really any of the critical infrastructure sectors, not just the federal government. So financials, healthcare, um, energy, transportation, right? The, so this zero trust maturity model isn't just for like the U.S. public sector. It's, you know, it's out there for everybody to understand. This is literally a screenshot from what they call their zero trust maturity uh, model. And what they've done is they've outlined zero trust in terms of five pillars, identity, devices, networks, application workloads, and data, right? Those are the five pillars going across, but it's extremely important to cast your eyes down on things like visibility and analytics, right? That means that these pillars work together and they share information, automation and orchestration, right? So that, if, for example, a device posture changes, it informs the identity pillar. Right, and then also underpinned all that is things like governance. So when you go through the course of this presentation, try to keep this in, this visual in mind. Right, these five pillars underscored by these integrating aspects or these core like uh, functional you know pieces that bring all these pillars together. Again, these are not meant to act you know in silos. On the next slide, I was going to show that um, the CISA zero trust maturity model also shows like this idea that there's a journey involved here. Right, it's not just you know, we have to just jump from, you know, zero to hero, right? Um, traditional starts at the very bottom, and that's that perimeter-based approach, right? That traditional approach that we just talked about. And what the model does is build capabilities across each of those pillars and functions so that you can get to so an initial step for, towards zero trust maturity. And the goal, obviously, is to get to optimal zero trust maturity. This visual isn't meant to say, like, there's an end state here. But the idea is to get to an optimal set of maturity that takes into account that real-time analysis, right? So that's something to consider when we, when we go through this, right? Kind of break any big problem down into smaller pieces. On the next slide, the last couple of slides here before I turn it over to Dimitri, as I was going to point out that this diagram might look a little complicated. Um, this comes out of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, what they call the Zero Trust Architecture, or NIST SP 800-207. It's a long thing. But really what you want to do is look to the far left where you have things like subject and a system. That's like the user and devices that you're using. And that should really say untrusted, right? And on the right-hand side is the resource that they're trying to access. And that little line going to it should say trusted, right? And what we're really trying to say here is that a zero trust logical diagram takes into account every access request to a resource, right? It's not just uh, you know logging into a server and getting access to everything that's on there, right? Uh, resources can be something very specific, like a view within a given application. And when you see that passing through is that policy enforcement point, because what happens is when that subject and system try to access that resource, not only the, their context, contextual information and the metadata around that real-time continuous analysis, you know, a portion occur, but that gets fed up to that policy decision point to actually say, hey, 
what kind of decision do we make based upon that real-time analysis for the subject and their system to go and access that resource? Are they authorized to do it? Is the risk po profile you know, too high, right? What, what should we do it or not, right? And then that access decision passes down through to that resource and then that person either gets access or not, or perhaps the access gets revoked, right? So that's just a simple way of looking at this. And you can see how there's like a control plane, right? That's where the decisions are made. And the data plane is kind of where that data flows. Right, so kind of again, sort of keep that in mind when you're looking through, you know, the presentation here. Um, we'll jump to the next slide, and um, what we're saying here is that, uh, is, you know, I mentioned those different planes, right? This identity control plane. Your eye is probably drawn to that big, you know, dark <laughs> circle in the center. And what we've done is sort of sliced out a lot of the identity control plane capabilities, things like, you know, user assurance, device assurance policy, right? Things like that con contextual access, taking into account that real-time context, that metadata that was shown on the previous slide about the device, the location, right? The, the um, you know, what group memberships they're in, what kind of application they're accessing, right? That, that kind of information. So again, this diagram sort of matches what we had seen previously on things like those different pillars. You can see where on the left, identity and devices, we have network, and as we move to the right, we have applications and data. Underpinned by, you can see those things like automation and orchestration. So that's when we talk about identity capabilities like lifecycle management, just-in-time provisioning, you know, role-based, attribute-based access control, things like that. Governance, which is dealing with things like making sure that people have the right uh, access, right? certifying the fact that they have the right level of access, and then underpinned by things like visibility analytics. And that's when we get into things like that continuous monitoring, right? Um, you know, automated workflows that drive the, uh, you know, those integrations, right? Um, and uh, in those types of integration type capabilities. So as we go through of this, um, I think, Dimitri, this is where I, I turn it over to you. But uh, I wanted to see if there was any questions before we uh, we move forward here. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I think we will take the question on the, on the Q&A or at the end if we have time. But we have quite a lot of content to cover today. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, so this is Dimitri. Uh, it's my time to welcome you to, to this webinar. And uh, Brent, if you can uh, advance to the uh, OICL. Perfect. So now that we've seen uh, what it means to get on a journey to, to zero trust uh, with the, the principle that uh, Steve highlight, uh, how can our Okta help? So OIE, Okta Identity Engine, is a free full platform upgrade that delivers both an insecurity and uh, improved user experience. And among other things, uh, OIE accelerates a number of scenario passwordless, uh, flexible and scalable secure identity, and uh, the star of the show today, zero trust. Uh, underlying uh, Okta Identity Engine is a number of uh, new features, and uh, we're going to be discussing some today, uh, specifically uh, phishing resistant with FastPass and advanced device context. Uh, and you will see later in the presentation, there's a whole list of uh, new features from OIE, but we're not going to spend time on, on all the details here. So if you want to move on to the, the next slide. Now, before we, we get into the, the meat of uh, how OIE uh, supports Zero Trust, I want to uh, introduce a few uh, new concepts uh, that might be different from Classic. Note that uh, all uh, Okta new customers since March 2022 uh, have been running on OIE, and there are more than 8,000 of them. So it's a, it's a really uh, proven upgrade. Um, so let's dive in into the, the, the new uh, concept uh, on the next slide. First one is authenticators, uh, which is a new vocabulary we use in OIE now. Authenticators are what the end user we use to uh, identify, authenticate. And authenticators have authentication method. So you have a few uh, on this uh, slide here. Let's take examples just to make it concrete. Uh, password is an obvious uh, classic uh, authenticators, a string of uh, secret characters, a secret string of characters. And it is of a knowledge type, uh, a knowledge factor type. It is something that you know. A phone is a different authenticator. It's something that you own, a possession factor type. And uh, note that a phone has actually two authentication method, SMS and voice. Now, probably the most uh, sophisticated and interesting authenticators are authenticator apps, uh, such as uh, Okta Verify or OWN. Um, and it's a very powerful authenticator in the sense that it combines multiple factor types. Uh, for instance, uh, it's an app on your phone, so it's a possession factor type. But if your phone has biometrics, like a face ID or a touch ID, it can also leverage inherence uh, factors. So you can have multiple factors on, uh, on authenticators. So authenticator first concept. Moving on to the next uh, concept in the, um, on the deck, uh, the application uh, uh, framework, application 
policy framework is uh, is a bit different between classic and uh, and uh, and uh, OAE. In classic, you have a, a sign-on policy, which is on the on the on the left of the slide, and uh, you also have related sign-on at the application level uh, if you choose to do so. Now, OAE strengthens this logic. If we can click here now, so you can see that uh, on the on the on classic, you initially have only uh, the ability to put a password or an authenticator sequence. At the global level policy, which we where all users will go when they try to authenticate, you now have the possibility to delegate to the application level policy. So if you set it up this way, the global policy will be passed through and now we'll go into the application level policy. Now at the application level policy, if you can click please, you actually do not describe a sequence of authenticators, but you describe the uh, security outcome you want to have. So click again. So you can see that I'm able to set, specify if I want any two-factor type, if I want a, a possession factor, or if I want a, pos a password plus another factor. And if you click again one final time, you can see that OIE will conveniently display among the authenticators you have selected uh, what will be available to the end user. So in our cases here, it's obviously a password first, and then another factor like email, Google Authenticator, or, or um, Octa Verify. So a much more abstract way to describe your policy, very focused on, uh, on security outcome. On the next slide, the device context, we're going to go much more into detail. So I'm gonna, not going to spend too much time here, but you will see that we had device trust in Octa Classic. Now we have um, a device assurance. We have integration with MDM and endpoints. And we can put all this together into the policy. We will see that practically uh, very, very soon. On the next slide, you have actually all the different features in OIE. So again, I'm not going to list them all here. You see things like phishing resistance, a flexible account recovery, device context that we're going to talk about. And uh, now, if we uh, finally move on uh, to the next slide, we are going to look at a before and after upgrading uh, scenario here. What we have done on the next slide is we have created a very simple classic org, two groups, two users, and two applications. And uh, what we're going to see in the demo is uh, how it is before and how it is after. So we created two instances of the classic org, and we've upgraded one, so you can see the difference. So if you can uh, let the get the demo going, uh, Brent, please. So let's uh, leave uh, the slideshow here. And uh, I'm going to go first into my uh, Okta Classic org, which is uh, here, I'm going to the dashboard. And uh, as you can see, we are logging as an admin, and uh, we have the banner offering us to do the safe service upgrade. So we're not going to do that. As I explained, we have two orgs, one that is zero graded, and this one. Yeah. So let's briefly look at how this <laughs> one is set up. Uh, first of all, if I go into yeah. directory and groups, uh, you will see that we have uh, two groups, advanced users and normal users. And we have in people, we are going to find two users, uh, Nancy and James, which are in this uh, respective group. So that's the setup for, for uh, uh, in terms of users. If I look into security and authentication and go into the uh, sign-on policy, nothing is fancy about the, uh, the password policy. So uh, obviously it is here. And if I go into sign-on, you can see that uh, there's the default policy and there's a specific for policy for advanced users. And this specific policy actually requires a factor sequencing. And we will see what happened to that when we uh, when we upgrade. So that's for um, the authentication. Um, and uh, Ma, if we look at um, the applications, we do have two applications which are bookmark app, as I explained. And uh, if we look, for instance, at Business Insider, Business Insider bookmark app as a sign-on policy. And that sign-on policy for normal users requires multi-factor. Uh, because normal users do not have a, a sign-on policy uh, in uh, authentication uh, that uh, requires uh, the multi-factor here. So that's the very simple setup. Uh, last thing to notice is a device trust here for which we actually don't have anything set up, uh, neither for iOS, Windows, or macOS, but just flashing that so you will see uh, how it uh, transforms into the upgraded org. So let's assume that we go to dashboard. Uh, we Here we go back to dashboard and we click on schedule, schedule upgrade here. We go through the process. We, we might show you at the end of the webinar if we have time. And voila, 
Now we log in to the, uh, as an admin to the new upgraded uh, org 2 ie So you will see a banner saying that uh, it's been completed. Uh, looking at the directory, we are going to find the same things. There are actually a few uh, more groups and users because we use this uh, org for demos. But if I go into group, I'm going to find my advanced users and my normal users as before. No changes here. And if I go to people, I'm going to find my uh, Nancy and my James. Uh, nothing uh, fancy here as well. The first thing you can see that uh, you have a new choice devices, uh, which we allows you to actually see the different devices that are registered to the users. We'll talk about that later in the webinar, but that's the first change in OIE. The directory allows you to have a look into devices. Now, if I go in security, uh, as I explained in the fundamentals, uh, what is the, the, the first thing you want to have a look is the authenticators. So authenticators here, you can see the different ones that have been set up. So we have in your email, OctaVerify, password, nothing fancy. And we can obviously uh, add authenticators here if you want. And we can define the enrollment policies on this tab. Now, that's the authenticators. Now, first thing the users go through in OIE is the global session policy. So if I look at the global session policy here, you will see that a policy has been created for my advanced users. And if I open this one, I will see my factor sequencing because I had this in my OctaClassit org, but I have the ability to actually delegate now this new choice in OIE uh, to uh, the application level uh, policy or the authentication policy. So any factor used to meet the authentication policy requirements. So that's uh, what, what will happen. But again, it will look pretty much the same uh, as you, you had in, uh, in, uh, in Okta Classic. Now, if I go into uh, applications now here and I look at uh, my applications and let's say, uh, let's look at the Wikipedia application. Now I can see that there is a sign on for application. And if I scroll down here, I can see that there is a specific policy that was created. Now, because I had sign on in Classic, Okta uh, during the upgrade would automatically create a specific policy for this application. If I go into security and application policy, I will also find all my application level policy here. And you can see I have the WAPI app Wikipedia here, which I can uh, go and have a look. And uh, there is actually a, a basic rule that was created um, uh, based on what we had as a sign on in uh, Okta Classic. And again, the interesting thing is uh, this application level policy that can be applied to multiple applications. So you're going to see a little few things that are different. So authenticators here, global session policy, authentication policy at your app level. And you see also that in terms of device, and again, we'll talk much more about that. You see device assurance and device integration here, uh, which we will develop uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So that's a very brief overview of a before, after um, the upgrade from Classic to OAE. And uh, let's uh, now uh, continue on the on our journey into zero trust. So let's. Uh, Thank you, Brent. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go quickly on those two slides. They'll actually uh, recap, and you can use them for reference when we publish the deck. So if you can click once, so what we've seen that from classic authentication go into a global session policy. Click again. Uh, the multi factors goes into authenticator. Click again. The application sign-on goes into the authentication policy. And finally, click again, the device trust go into device assurance and device integration. So it's kind of a reference sheet. Uh, if you just upgraded to OI, it might be useful. Uh, next slide covers also the differences between the, the sign-on and the global session policy. So the most important uh, addition that we've seen uh, uh, in OIE. Now, one note here, I want to just spend a, a minute on that. Um, not all customers use factor sequencing. So if you never use factor sequencing in classing, so if you don't know what it is, you will actually not see it in OIE. Uh, the way we construct policy in OIE, as you've seen, is as an abstract level. So creating factor sequence doesn't make sense anymore in OIE. But if you've been using it in classic, you will find it back in uh, after the upgrade. So let's uh, move on to the to the next slide now. And uh, now we've seen uh, the before after. We've seen the concept in OIE. Now let's see how we can apply some of those capabilities of OIE in a, in a zero trust uh, uh, scenario. So we've selected four areas that we want to cover uh, for you today um, that uh, that uh, that support uh, deploying zero trust. So. OIE aligns with NIST recommendation and allow to take uh, an approach based on designing and implementing assurance level. So we're going to discuss those assurance level and, and I will show you how to design yours. Then we will look at one simple, very practical implementation of a rule following those new uh, principles. 
And uh, after that, uh, we will look at, uh, I will hand over to Brent to look into a uh, passwordless uh, with phishing resistance and continuous uh, enforcement. If you can click uh, here, now you can see that those concepts obviously map, uh, the assurance level policy really create this tight in uh, connection between identity and devices. And the uh, passwordless obviously reinforces the identity pillar and continuous monitoring is across the board of the foundation for zero trust. So let's dive in into uh, assurance level with OIE uh, for this privilege. Uh, next slide, please. Now, first thing you have to understand in the model is obviously authenticators. We talked about it. I'm not going to say much more here. The only thing I want to highlight is uh, you can obviously add authenticators and specifically authenticators like, um, like uh, FIDO2 or YubiKeys or smart card authenticators, which are important in some uh, assurance level as defined by NIST. Now, moving on, uh, when you uh, implement your strategy for, for architecting policy or, or creating the anatomy of the policy, these are the concepts you're going to be using. You're going to be using first authentication risk, device context, and have your application sorted into a different sensitivity level. Now, authentication risk and the application sensitivity or grouping applications into different buckets is not something completely new. Uh, you could do that in classic. The boxes in blue here show you where OIE provide significant improvements, and we're going to be looking into that. So once you have this first layer, you go into the assurance level, you link that to authenticators, and you can define your authentication uh, strategy here. So let's get a little more into the details now. Okta Risk Engine, as I said, already exists in Classic. It allows you to look at things like uh, IP address, device location. If it is the same from a previous connection, it's low risk. If something's changed a little bit, it's a medium risk. And if something's changed significantly, like an impossible travel or a new device or first time login, then it's higher risk. So obviously you can use uh, the Risk Engine in your policy in your way, obviously. Now, first step in your strategy is to classify your application. And this is a suggest classification. Uh, you can have more layer or less layer if you want. But typically, we will look at a low sensitivity app, which are applications that do not have any sensitive data. So cafeteria menu, help desk, educational app. app. Uh, the next level, uh, medium six sensitivity, would be application that do have some sensitive data, but uh, not extremely sensitive data, I would say. So things like communication application, collaboration, uh, marketing content apps. And finally, at the highest level, uh, you might have, you will have applications with a proprietary data, regulated data, healthcare, financial, and these are the, the apps that will be uh, most protected. So once you have those two concepts, we can start looking at devices. Now, if you look at device trust, you had the ability to uh, gather uh, information uh, from uh, MDM tools in, uh, in Okta Classic. In OIE, it's a much more sophisticated approach. You basically have three angles or three dimensions that you can combine in your policy. First one is registered device. Okta Verify, when it's installed and enrolled on the device, creates this registration of the device. It creates a very strong binding between the user and the device using cryptography, and it's even stronger if the device has a secure enclave. It can also get you some of the basic attributes, what we call device health, and uh, for this is the OS dependent. For example, in Mac OS, you can capture the level of OS, uh, if the device has a password, if Touch ID is enabled, and if the disk is encrypted, without needing any MDM. So it's kind of useful if you have BYOD device. Second part is managed device. What we call managed device is that there is an MDM solution, so you can use pretty much anyone you want, as long as you have a, it support a SCP protocol. And the uh, OIE knows that the device is managed and OIE will be able to receive signal from the device and integrate those signals in the policies that are constantly evaluated using custom encryption. Finally, we can also connect to a, and have what we call secure device, which is connecting to endpoint security solution. If you have one deployed, on your devices, like a CrowdStrike or Windows Security Center. And the same thing, you will be able to capture signals from here and create policies that takes those signals into account. Now, now that we have done this setup of, uh, of the, the different risk level, the, the, the device context, and uh, bucketed our applications into a, a different uh, sensitivity level, we now can look at assurance level, what assurance level we will need, and then we will map that to this uh, complete framework. Now, here we're taking NISC uh, recommendation about uh, the different assurance levels that they've defined. So there's three levels, level one, level two, level three. 
you have the list of authenticators and the additional collaboration uh, consideration. So, so let's look very briefly. So level one is any one factor type, so a password on an OTP, and re-authentication after uh, 30 days. And that satisfies uh, this definition of uh, authentication assurance level one. Level two, you need two factors, two factor types. So for example, a password and an octa verifier OTP or a fast pass with biometrics. And re-authentication 12 hours and session should, uh, should be uh, terminated if they handle more than 30 minutes. Finally, at the highest level, uh, NIST uh, requires a smart card or a password per phishing resistant authenticator and uh, some adjustment into the timing here, especially on the other session time. Now, now that we've done and put all those things together, you can now create your own, um, I would say, the policy architecture on the next slide where you would actually create this map. And that's an example. It's not a, a reference model by any mean, but it's a, it's actually a pretty stringent uh, uh, example. But you will see that on the uh, on the uh, horizontal axis, you have your progression of devices, whether they are unregistered, registered, managed, or managed and secure. And then you see that whether you have a, a low um, uh, risk uh, aspect, a low risk uh, uh, information given by the uh, risk engine or medium or high. And then on the vertical axis, you have your low impact application, medium impact application, and high impact application. And then you populate those cells with the different authentication level you require, uh, depending again on the sensitivity and the risk level. So in this example, you can see that for unregistered and registered device, we actually deny access to high impact app. And if you're on an unregistered device, you need the highest level of, uh, of uh, authentication assurance to be able to connect to the application. And uh, on the managed device, uh, if we look at uh, in the medium uh, impact application and medium risk, you only require the authentication level two, uh, which is the example we're going to see in the in the in the next demo. So that's an overview on you know what you should be thinking about in terms of uh, risk score, device context, application sensitivity, authentication level, authenticators, and how to put this together into a map for your whole organization. So it is an exercise you have to go through, but it's a, it's a pretty powerful framework. Now to illustrate this framework, uh, if we go to the next slide, we're going to take that exact same matrix and we're going to look out uh, this example of a user coming with a managed, registered and managed device, accessing a medium impact application, and how do we put this together practically uh, with the different policies uh, in uh, OAE. So if we can move on to the next slide and run the demo. So let's uh, look on how we implement um, uh, a policy for this uh, assurance level two for um, uh, registered and managed devices. So I am going to quit slide mode here and go back to my uh, OIE org. So the same one you, you've seen the before of a scenario. Um, now, first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a group for for the, the users that would be uh, dealing with the right to. So let's say that the scenario here is that when we start onboarding new users for now on, we want them to be on, on a zero trust scenario. So ZT for new users. Uh, so just Going to create a group here and then we'll uh, associate the, the policy to this group and we'll put users in this group so nothing special here now if you remember what i uh, uh, introduced earlier about oie the first thing to do uh, when uh, implementing policy in oie is you go look at the global session policy so here i'm going to add a policy which is going to be a new users uh, users uh, zt as well uh, ZT for new users, and we're going to apply this uh, policy to uh, this group that we just created here. Here we go, and create a rule. And here, uh, just new users uh, ZT as the name, name for the rule. And uh, we're not going to do uh, anything uh, sophisticated here. We're going to allow everybody, but we are going to transfer to uh, the application level policy. So this will recapture uh, the users in this uh, in this group and we delegate to the uh, application level policy, uh, not even changing anything on the session management. Keep it simple. Uh, maybe just want to put the rule higher up in the order. Now, we have done a little bit of pre-work here. So because the second thing you will do uh, in OI is you will create authentication policy 
for your different applications. So if you look at inter authentication policy here, we actually have created the three buckets that we presented in the model. So we have high impact app, low impact app, and medium impact apps. And in our case, what we want to do is we want to look at medium impact apps. Right now, there's only one rule here, which is a catch-all rule. So we are going to create a new rule here, uh, which we are going to create this rule for registered and managed device. Managed devices. Um, so it's going to be for any user in the group, new users. users it in. And here you can see that the, the, the device state can be selected. So by default, it's any. So we're going to say it has to be registered and it has to be managed. So if I have a registered and a managed device, now I still require a good level of authentication. So what are we going to require here? I am going to require, so uh, access will be allowed, any two factor types. So here I'm going to follow uh, the NIST recommendation for an authentication level two. And uh, in the real authentication frequency, I think in the model we had 12 hours. So I'm going to do 12 hours here. And I'm going to save that. Now, I've created that rule. The next uh, thing to do will be obviously to assign application to, uh, to that, uh, to that uh, authentication policy. So we have implemented uh, very quickly in OIE a uh, national level two for a uh, medium level app on registered and managed devices. So that's the overview, and I'm going to hand it over to Brent right now for the continue the, the next features in OIE. All right, thanks, Dimitri. Now let's take a look at another key component of our zero trust strategy, which is passwordless authentication and, and phishing resistant authentication. Uh, so first, let's think about some of the challenges when trying to go passwordless. Uh, first of all, a, a password when done properly is or it can be a, a uh, valid authenticator. So it, as long as the password hygiene is good and the, the uh, complexity is good, uh, it can be a, a fairly strong uh, knowledge um, factor. Uh, and eliminating password does eliminate essentially a factor type. It, it's pretty much the, the only knowledge factor type available. So uh, you are limiting yourself in terms of the uh, factor types when you're trying to implement a true multi-factor uh, policy. As a result, if you eliminate passwords, you're basically down to uh, biometrics and inheritance, or, or excuse me, possession and inheritance. Uh, so your possession factors, your, uh, your biometrics, et cetera. So let's look at Okta's solution for this. So FastPass is an authentication method that enables secure passwordless and phishing resistant authentication on basically anything you need uh, from any device in any location. You can use this to enforce uh, uh, phishing based um, or phishing resistant authentication on uh, app policies. Uh, it integrates uh, with basically any device management tool that uh, that's out there pretty much. Uh, and it natively collects device context information for you and, and uh, exposes that for use in your policy settings as well as in your system logs. So I mentioned uh, NIST guidelines around uh, phishing resistant authentication. Let's take a look at what those guidelines are. So first of all, there should be a cryptographic binding between the authenticator and the user identity. There should be no shared secrets such as a password or secret questions. There should be origin binding and channel binding for the authenticator. And uh, it should be high assurance uh, and proof of possession. So let's take a look at what's going on under the hood uh, with FastPass and see how it can address those NIST guidelines. So before you can use uh, FastPass as an authenticator, you have to enroll your device in FastPass. Now, there are multiple ways to do this, but let's consider a use case where our user, uh, Dimitri, has received a laptop from the company he just joined. He needs to install the OctaVerify app, or it could have been pre-installed uh, for him, and then initiate the enrollment process. Now, he's going to be asked to authenticate to his company's Okta tenant uh, with other factors. And these could be uh, factors that have been pre-staged uh, by his company, whether it's a password, email, magic link, or an SMS OTP. Um, after that authentication, Dimitri can then complete the enrollment process by uh, enabling biometrics on his device, such as face ID or fingerprint scan. And at that point, he's all set. He's enrolled and, and ready to use FastPass as an authenticator. 
Now, behind the scenes, FastPass creates a cryptographic key pair, and it stores the private key securely in the device's TPM. It sends the public keys to the Okta backend, where Okta securely stores the information and the public key to complete the enrollment. Now, let's revisit those NIST guidelines to see how FastPass addresses those. So first off, FastPass is generating a strong public-private key pair using ES-256 or RS-256 algorithms backed by the user's biometrics. So this satisfies the cryptographic binding between authenticator and user identity. Also, the private key that gets generated in this, in this process never leaves the device. So this uh, satisfies the high assurance proof of possession guideline. All right, now that we've enrolled, let's see what's happening with the actual authentication flow in FastPass. So there are multiple methods uh, to securely authenticate using FastPass, depending on your operating system, browser, and native apps. But today, let's focus on one of the primary methods, which is called a loopback server method. Uh, in this method, FastPass runs as an HTTP server on your, a local port that's listening to authentication requests from Okta. Uh, this diagram shows how that authentication works. So once enrolled, the first thing Dimitri wants to do is log in to his email account. So since his Gmail authentication is managed by Okta, it's going to redirect the browser to Okta for authentication. Okta loads the browser with the sign-in widget, the Okta sign-in widget, along with uh, along with the sign-in widget, we're going to send a unique identifier called a nonce that will be used during this authentication flow. Now, the, the widget is going to invoke the FastPass local server. It initiates the authentication request and begins polling the Okta backend periodically. FastPass is going to prompt the user for biometrics. It takes the nonce that was sent by Okta in the previous step and builds a response. FastPass includes the origin domain and the device posture signals in the response payload. It then signs the response with the private key and sends it to Okta. The origin domain here is a key, a, a key part of this process. So that helps Okta detect adversaries in the middle during phishing attacks. Um, Okta is going to use the public key to verify the sign nonce, the origin domain, uh, and it performs a policy evaluation at this point. If the user and the device both meet the policy criteria, then it's going to respond with a SAML assertion or an access token, uh, whatever the case may be, to access the application, in this case, Gmail, and complete the authentication process into the app. Now, this method is highly secure and highly resistant to phishing attacks. Um, additionally, combined with third-party integrations like CrowdStrike, uh, you can gather additional device posture signals beyond just the native ones that are captured by uh, FastPass, OctaVerify by, by default. Now, if we go back to those NIST guidelines on strong phishing-resistant authenticators, uh, in this authentication flow, there are no shared secrets, such as passwords in the authentication flow. So that checks that box off. And as you can see in step four, FastPass sends the origin domain, or excuse me, origin domain from the browser and signs it with the with the bio um, excuse me biometrically protected private key so that it can't be tampered with before sending to the Okta backend. So that checks off the last uh, requirement, origin and channel binding. So, um, in addition to all of that, there are some advantages FastPass has over uh, WebAuthn, which is another uh, inherence. Uh, factor option that you have available in, in Okta. So number one, uh, FastPass Okta Verify provides native device context. So there's no third-party integration required to get device context and uh, security signals directly from your device. Um, you can, however, get additional uh, device signals with third-party integrations through uh, FastPass. And, and that device context and the, and the risk signals is available not only within your uh, your policy evaluations, but also it's all logged to the system log, so you can use it for uh, uh, like audits, uh, like uh, driving um, workflows, orchestrations after the fact, etc. All right, so let's take a quick look at the admin checklist for setting up uh, or actually implementing a passwordless flow uh, in. Okta in, in OIE. So the first thing you're going to want to do is to create a group for passwordless users. You're going to want to create an enrollment policy that allows for passwords to be optional for a group of users. You're going to want to update your uh, Okta Verify authenticator to make sure that FastPass is actually activated um, once you upgrade. 
And then uh, you'll create a global sign-on policy that essentially delegates to the app level policy as far as the authenticator requirements. Um, you'll add rules to the app level policy uh, for passwordless users. And then finally, uh, you'll want to let your end users know that you're, you're implementing this so that they are prepared for the passwordless world. All right, let's take a quick look at all of this in action. So for this demonstration, we're going to take a look at the end-to-end -end process of setting up uh, a passwordless experience using Okta FastPass, everything from creating all the policy uh, frameworks around this all the way through to the end user experience of enrolling in FastPass and finally authenticating with FastPass. Now, the first thing that we're going to want to do is to make sure that we've actually enabled FastPass. Uh, if you've just upgraded to OIE, you will not have FastPass enabled by default. So you'll want to go to your authenticators, find the Okta Verify authenticator, and make sure that you check the box to enable Okta FastPass. I've already done this, but uh, as I said, when you first upgrade, this will not be set by default. All right, now that FastPass is enabled, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a group. I'm going to use this group to associate all of the policies that, that I'm going to be creating here. So my uh, session policy and my um, enrollment policies, etc. So I'll just call this password users group. And now that I have my group, I am going to start creating my policies. So first thing I'm going to start with is the global session policy. And what I want to do here uh, is I'll just add a new policy for demonstration purposes. And I'm going to call this policy uh, passwordless policy. And I'm going to go ahead and associate this to my passwordless users group. And the key thing here is, uh, I'll give this rule a name. Uh, the key thing here for this rule is I want to make sure that I choose the option to establish the session with any factor that meets the authentication policy requirements. So effectively what you're doing here with this option is you're delegating the requirements to the app level. Uh, so any any factor that satisfies the app level authentication policy can be used to establish a session here. I'm not going to require MFA as part of the session policy. I'll again defer that to the app level policy. All right. Now uh, I'll make sure I move this up to the top of the list of my policies here, so it uh, gets executed for my test user. And now. I'm going to create an application that I can use for the app level policy. So uh, in this case, I'm just actually going to use a bookmark app. Let me uh, find the bookmark app in our app catalog here. And we'll, for demonstration purposes, just add a simple bookmark app to the REM headquarters website. And I will go ahead and assign this app to my passwordless users group as well. So I'll assign this to that group. All right. All right. And now that I have an application, I can create a application level uh, authentication policy. So I'm going to move now back to security and authentication policies. And I'll add a new policy here. I'll call this passwordless policy.
And for the rule here, uh, I am going to focus on the MFA requirements. So the first thing is I'm going to uh, say that we have to use two factors, but we can use any two factor types to authenticate to this app. Um, and for this, I'm actually going to put some constraints on here. So I'm going to uh, actually going to require this to be use a phishing resistant as well as a hardware protected um, authenticator for this particular application. So I'll select these constraint options for phishing resistant and hardware protected. And you notice as I do this, it adjusts the authenticators in the boxes below that actually will satisfy this. So by making these selections, I'm essentially limiting myself to uh, OctaVerify or FIDO2 WebAuthn to authenticate for this. Uh, also, you'll notice down at the bottom here that I can set the reauthentication frequency. Um, we'll, come, we'll revisit this a little bit later, but uh, for now, we're just going to set this to reauthenticate uh, every, after every 12 hours. And we'll come back to this in a later segment. But for now, let's just save this as it is. Actually, let's make this two hours, not, not 12. All right. All right, so now I need to associate this to my app. So I'll find my REMHQ app, assign that to this policy. And now I'm all set. So I have all, all of my policy framework in place. Now let's add my test user. So we will go up to, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, there is one more thing I need to do. Uh, I need to add my enrollment policy. I want to make sure that my uh, authenticator enrollment policies allow for a passwordless user. So let's add a policy here and we'll call this passwordless policy or password optional and I'm gonna set I'm gonna first of all assign this to my passwordless users group and I'm gonna set email to required and everything else optional now one or the other uh, either email or password one of the two has to be set to required so in order for me to set password to optional, I have to set email required here. And I'm going to go ahead and disable security question just because it's a terrible authenticator. Um, all right, we'll add the rule here for this enrollment policy, and we'll just let this apply in any scenario. Um, all right, so we'll create our rule. All right, and we want to make sure that we move that uh, policy up to the top as well so that we make sure that it applies to my test user because I think some of these other ones may be uh, assigned to the everyone group. So we'll move that up to the top. All right, and now I have all of my policy set up in place and I can go ahead now and create my user. So let's go to directory and people. And let's add a person. And I'm going to, going to add Michael Stipe of REM fame. Actually, that's just the first name. Sorry, let me fix that. And as I'm adding this user, I've got to make sure I get the email domain correct. Uh, as I'm adding this user, I'm going to add this user to the passwordless group. And I'll go ahead and activate the user. And once I've created this user, I'm going to actually go in and grab the Okta ID, the GUID for this new user that got created. I'm going to use that to go ahead and stage, like pre-enroll uh, a phone factor, an SMS factor for this user. 
So I'm going to grab his GUID here, and then I'm going to go into Postman and just use an API call here to pre-enroll this user in an SMS authenticator. So I'll plug in my user ID to this API endpoint. I'll make sure I set activate to true, which will immediately activate that without requiring verification by the user. I'll put in the phone number. This is something that, that can be done to sort of pre-stage uh, phone factors. It can be done through scripting. It can be done through workflows. Uh, for this example, I'll just do this with a simple Postman call. And now I'm going to switch context here. I'm going to go over into a different browser profile. And this is a profile that I'm setting up for my uh, test user, Michael Stipe. So I'll be using this browser profile uh, for the end user authentication. I'm going to open the OctaVerify app that's already installed. You'll see that I already have a couple of accounts here because this is used for a lot of testing. I, If this were my first account, I would just see a big button that says Get Started. But that'll take me to the same place here where I put in my URL. And this can be a custom URL uh, if you have one set up as well. And that's going to redirect me in my browser to sign in. I put in my username. I say Next. And you'll notice that I already have two authenticators. So email was auto-enrolled by virtue of being set to required. Uh, and then the phone factor is there by virtue of the uh, pre-staged API call that we made. So I'm going to go ahead and use the phone factor here to authenticate. I'll get my code. And now my identity is verified. It takes me back into the OctaVerify app. I can enable Touch ID. Uh, I'm going to set this as my default account for that domain. That's because I already have another uh, account registered on this device for that domain. So when I click the Authenticate with FastPass button by setting this one to the default, that's that's the user that it's going to log me in as. All right, so that's it. I'm enrolled. And now if I go to my Okta URL, again, still in my end user persona here, and sign in with FastPass, you can see that I am in. I'm in as Michael. Now I have my app assignment here. Now remember this app, I required uh, multi-factor and I required phishing resistant. So you notice here I get this additional prompt. Um, I'm, it's prompting me for biometrics. Uh, when I initially logged into the dashboard, it did not prompt me for biometrics through uh, OctaVerify. That is because uh, it was just using the, the possession factor, uh, but because the app required two factors, uh, it prompted me for biometrics. All right, now let's move on and let's look at some additional uh, some additional features here around continuous enforcement and visibility. So for that, we're going to take a look at reauthentication policies as well as device visibility in OIE. All right, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to revisit my authentication policy that we used for our previous example. So I'm going to find the passwordless policy here. And specifically, uh, I'm going to edit this rule. And I'm going to change this reauthenticate after setting to bump this down to two minutes as opposed to two hours so that we can demonstrate this a little more effectively. So let me save this. And once I have saved that, I'm going to switch context back over to my end user uh, profile in my browser. And I'm going to sign in again with FastPass. I'll be signing in again as my end user, Michael Stipe. And I have two applications now. Uh, so you can see I'm logged in as Michael. So the first app, the REMHQ app, has that policy, the passwordless policy. Um, that, that we just adjusted the reauthenticate after setting. The other one just has a standard NE2 uh, authenticators with uh, a setting to never prompt as long as the session is, is active. So never re-authenticate as long as the session is active. Um, so we'll just make sure we can get to both these applications and we're fine. So now we're going to leave this session open and kind of set this aside for a minute. And we'll wait for those two minutes to expire and then we'll come back to this. So while we're waiting, 
let's take a look at uh, some visibility features, uh, specifically around device visibility in OIE. So if we look at this from a user-centric approach, uh, if we pull up our test user that we just created, we can see that within that user uh, details page, we have a devices tab and we can see any registered device that that user has. So in this case, Michael only has one, which is the uh, MacBook that we just installed FastPass on. So we can drill into the details there. We can suspend, we can deactivate. Uh, we can uh, see some basic um, device information, operating system, et cetera, uh, security signals, et cetera. All of this is captured uh, natively by OctaVerify on the device itself. Uh, so we can see all this information here. All this gets logged in the system log as well at any time that that uh, device authenticates. Um, if we look at a different user that has more than one device, I'll pull myself up here and go to the devices tab. You can see if you have multiple devices, they'll all be listed here under the user. And again, for any one of them, you can drill into the details, suspend, deactivate. Uh, you can see all the security signals coming from that device. If it's a mobile device, you'll see jailbreak status, etc. cetera. Uh, so all this information is very helpful. And again, as I said, all this data is captured natively by OctaVerify, and it's visible not only here, but also in the system log. And in addition to this user-centric view, there's also now a device-centric view. So you can get a, a view here of all of the devices that are registered in your Okta tenant. You can search through the devices itself and you can filter this list. So you can filter by the enrollment mechanism. So Okta Verify obviously is one way to enroll devices. You also can create your own custom authenticator uh, with our SDK and use that to enroll devices as well. So I have one here in this, uh, in this tenant. So that's why that's showing up there. You can filter based on the platform uh, operating system. So if I want to see all my iOS devices, I can filter by there or Android devices or uh, Mac OS devices, etc. Uh, you can also filter uh, based on the access status. So newly created, active, suspended, deactivated. You can filter based on managed or not managed status and based on security signal information. So if you wanted to see if you have any devices that are jailbroken or rooted, you can filter on that. If you want to see any devices where the screen lock is disabled, you can filter on that. Um, so if you're trying to you know, root out devices that may be uh, not adhering to policies that you, that you would like, uh, is a very handy way to filter your device view here and, and see if you have any of those devices and take action on those if you want. All right, so now I'm going to switch context back uh, to my end user. Now that we've let some time pass, we can see that my session is still active because I can access the app that does not prompt for reauthentication. Uh, but now when I try to access my REMHQ app, because it's been longer than two minutes, I am going to get prompted for reauthentication for this app. And you notice that this actually follows uh, the authentication policies that were initially established for that app as far as uh, the constraints requiring phishing resistance um, and multi-factor there. So, all right. Uh, so uh, at checking the time, I realize we're running a little bit long here. Uh, the remainder of the content is really focused around walking through the upgrade process itself. Before I dive into that, though, I realize some people may not be able to hang out for that. I, I do want to call out, uh, please be on the lookout for uh, for the next uh, session in this series. It'll be sometime in late October. I'm working to uh, finalize the exact date, but that session will be a little different. It's going to be more of a town hall type of session. We're going to be joined by our director of Okta on Okta, which is the internal team here at Okta that's responsible for uh, implementing best practices for our own use of, of Okta. So we'll be talking about uh, Okta's transition from classic engine to OIE, and then uh, our adoption of the various OIE um, uh, uh, features and uh, the ROI that we've seen from that. And we'll have a good bit of time to take questions from the audience in that session as well. So it'll be less uh, pre, uh, I guess, pre-prepared content and more, more time for your questions. So be on the lookout for that. It'll be some time in late October. Uh, so hopefully your account teams or if you're a member of that discussion group, you'll see those notifications there. 
Um, all right. Uh, also, uh, I guess before, if you have to drop before you do, check the uh, chat window. I posted several helpful links there, including uh, the link to that OIE office hours discussion group where you'll find the slides for this session. I know several people had asked about that. Those will be posted there along with uh, updates on the next session, uh, as well as any other content that we have available. All right. So with that, let's now take a look at the process of uh, upgrading from Classic Engine to OIE. So before we start, uh, I want to highlight some of the, uh, or sorry, I want to highlight some of the resources that are available to you. Again, uh, in the chat window, uh, I've posted the links to several of those. There's the OIE Upgrade Hub on the Okta Help Center. There's the Okta Identity Engine Office Hours Discussion Group on the community site. We have a YouTube playlist now that has uh, not only the recordings for these webinar sessions, but also other uh, content that's more targeted around specific OIE related topics. So be sure to check out all of those resources. All right. Now, uh, the self-service uh, upgrade tooling. So first of all, what is it? Uh, it's some in-app tooling that will appear in the Okta dashboard to allow you to basically schedule your own upgrade from Classic to OIE. Uh, the steps are essentially uh, to, number one, check for your eligibility for an upgrade and complete any action items or acknowledge any consent items that are that are presented to you based on your specific org configuration, and then pick a date and time that you want to upgrade. Now, it's important to note that only super admins are ever going to see this tooling. Uh, no other admin level uh, has the capability to upgrade your org, uh, so this it is a highly restricted um, uh, function uh, within your, your um, tenant. Uh, there is also no upgrade now option, meaning uh, you, you can't accidentally click a button and kick off the upgrade process. What the tool allows you to do is schedule uh, an upgrade at a specified date and time that has to be a minimum of two hours out into the future. Um, so th there should be no such thing as an accidental upgrade, so you don't have to worry about uh, clicking on any buttons there. Um, in addition, once a, an upgrade is scheduled, all of the admins in your tenant will receive an email notification to let them know that the upgrade has been scheduled and, and the date and time of that upgrade. Now, uh, when you're ready to get started, the first step is to check your org for eligibility. So if you click the Get Started button, it will run that as eligibility check. And if your org has any configurations that need to be changed or if there are any uh, consent items that require acknowledgement, they're going to appear in this list here. Um, once you start uh, addressing any of these items, so uh, for the configuration changes, once you actually go in and make the uh, required changes per the documentation for each of those, you'll start to see those uh, be highlighted with a green check mark, meaning they've been satisfied and completed. Similarly, for any consent items, uh, once you have acknowledged those after reading the documentation around those those items, uh, you will uh, those will be shown here with a, a check mark, and you can see who uh, specifically acknowledged those if you're if you're uh, logging in as a super admin. Now, once you've done all that, the next step is just to pick your date and time. Again, as I said, uh, this the upgrade can be scheduled anywhere from two hours into the future up to thirty days into the future. Um, if for some reason there are certain dates that are not available, whether that's uh, you know particular system uh, upgrade or you know like uh, system maintenance type uh, issues or whatever the case or holidays, whatever the case may be, if there are any any dates that are uh, I guess not allowed for upgrades, those will be uh, grayed out for you, so you won't be able to select a, uh, I guess an inappropriate time for for the upgrade. And that's it. Uh, so once you've picked your date and time, you're now scheduled. Again, the admins will get the notifications, and you'll be able to see uh, the timing of the, or, you know, the status of your scheduled upgrade and the timing, et cetera, in the banner in the, the admin console. Um, if for some reason between the time that you schedule the upgrade and the time that the upgrade would actually take place, if something happens within your org if if there is a new configuration added that uh, would block you from upgrading that would basically need to be changed uh, in order for the upgrade to proceed the tooling will automatically stop your your upgrade so you would you would be blocked from upgrading until 
that uh, that issue is rectified and then you would be able to, to move forward with the upgrade again. And finally, once, once your upgrade is complete, you will get an additional email notification for all of your admins. You'll also see a banner uh, at the top of your admin console showing that your upgrade has been completed. And you'll see all of the new features that we highlighted here today. All right. So just to wrap up uh, in today's session, we went through uh, some uh, an overview of some zero trust principles uh, and trust models and looked at how uh, Okta can help with the identity first posture of your zero trust strategy. We reviewed some key new concepts in OIE. Uh, we took a look at what to expect in the before and after uh, upgrading to OIE. OIE. Um, we then zeroed in on some specific OIE features that can help you implement a zero trust strategy for your org. And finally, we walked through the process of upgrading your org from classic to OIE. As I mentioned earlier, uh, please do um, mark your calendars or we, we'll get a, a, an exact date out to you shortly, but uh, kind of be on the lookout for late October. Uh, our next session, which is going to be more of a town hall session where you'll get a chance to ask uh, lots of questions to our special guest, uh, John Lettinen, who's the director of Okta on Okta. Uh, we'll be talking about Okta's internal uh, transition from classic to OIE and uh, how how we've implemented the various features and the, 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 or the ROI that we've received from that. All right. With that, I know that we are over. I appreciate everyone's patience. Thanks for hanging hanging on with us. Uh, thank you very much for joining today's session. Um, again, the slides will be will be published on the uh, discussion group that's linked in the chat window, uh, and the video recording of this will be published to our YouTube channel in the playlist that's linked in the chat window as well. Um, for uh, Steve and Dimitri and uh, my colleagues who've been manning the uh, the Q and A session. Uh, thank you on behalf of all of us for joining, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everyone.